Hello and welcome again to this edition of Florida Internet and Television's Fi TV. I'm your host, Brad Swanson. We are once again coming to you just a few blocks from Florida's capital in the Technology Pavilion at the headquarters of Florida Internet and Television. I am joined by two extremely distinguished hosts. Let me give a little bit of their bio. They're with Federalist.com and Townhall.com. They are authors, pundits, uh, forces to be reckoned with in the political media. I am joined by Guy Benson and Mary Catherine Hamm. Welcome to the studio. Glad so glad to, to have you guys here. here. Great to be here. Okay, so what brings two nationally known syndicated folks are not syndicated but just nationally known to Tallahassee Florida why are you here well, mostly the weather but <laughs> yeah. we also have engagements <laughs> yeah we're gonna be talking to the James Madison Institute uh, here in Tallahassee about the themes of our book that we wrote together okay. a couple years ago called end of discussion sort of about free speech issues there's a new edition that came out in late 2017 and uh, the JMI folks said come on down let's talk about free speech and we're delighted to be here. Awesome, great partner organization to Florida Net and Television. We, we, we believe in free and unregulated markets as well, so uh, we look forward to hearing your talk tonight. We'll be there. Okay, so let's jump in. You guys are in the realm of political opinion leaders, um, authorities. How do you characterize yourself? Like, how would you describe what you do? Oh, it gets more complicated every day. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think our task right now, I mean, we're, we're certainly both right of center pundits, um, but also not, uh, I would say, critical of the Trump administration often. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a bit of a tricky position. Um, I think in this era, not everybody is on there, is wearing their correct jerseys all the time. Mm -hmm. We're switching it up a little bit. And my main attempt is just to be an honest broker, to look at the facts every day and try to attempt to interpret and, uh, and analyze to the best of my ability what exactly is going on, what is important and what's not. Right. Uh, and there tends to be a, a bit of hysteria in the news media what? Um, these no days. Way. So my attempt is to tamp some of that down when, when possible and to highlight things that are really important and just to be honest about where I'm coming from and what the facts might be. Right. So that's my, that's my role as it stands right I now. I love it, I love it. Guy, how about you? Uh, similar, so I'm at Fox News and she's at CNN. Mm -hmm. I'm at townhall.com, she's at The Federalist. I sort of view my role as a hybrid between commentary, analysis, and reporting. And I'm a Trump skeptical consultant conservative, and therefore, I find myself angering many people all the time, and I hear from them a lot. That's our brand. And that's right. fine. Uh, it's, well, if it's, you're not over the target, you won't be taking any flack, right? So I think that's that right. So I think the well, goal is to cliche. try as best we can to advance ideas mm -hmm. and stay true to what we believe and try to follow the facts, and sometimes that's great for the president, sometimes it's awful for the president, and not to be totally tribal, because I right. think tribalism yeah. is... Uh, can get toxic. Well, let's get into the tribal brand, right? There's Republican, there's conservatism, there's these, these definitions that I grew up that are completely defined in a different way today. How do you guys con uh, describe your brand of, of political thinking? I mean, are you conservatives? Are you Republicans? You're right of center? What does that mean? Yeah, so I generally, I'll either say right of center or I'm a libertarian-ish conservative. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of libertarian leanings. Um, it has gotten more confusing these days because the Republican Party, frankly, is more populist uh, than it is conservative. Right. And for a long time, there was an understanding that the conservative ideology, ideology is what was driving this party. Um, but I think the, the secret was that, um, in fact, those ideologues was, was not a huge group of people, and the American voter is not an ideologue. Um, and so when something else was offered to them after many years mm -hmm. of conservative doctrine in this party, they said, maybe we'll try that out. Right, um, and right. as, as a result, we have a very different party. Um, and that's, that's some of what Guy is talking about. Attempting to talk about ideas instead of uh, sometimes the the constant well, political drama is is what I'm longing for and hoping to do. Well, well, so so let's let's dive into that a little bit because I think you know both parties struggle with this. But if we're thinking about conservatives or Republicans or or, or libertarians, you know some some have said, and I think you guys have said at times that they're failing to connect with that conservative voter or that libertarian voter or the voter of the future, if you will. You know how is that happening, and what's the remedy? I don't know if there's an easy remedy. I mean, so for me, I actually believed some of the things that I thought more people believed and turned out maybe not so much to be the case. So it goes back to the previous answer. When we're looking at issues in DC, so like the tax reform bill, mm -hmm. right? I was all for it. I think it's the right thing to do. I'm glad it passed and it's working well, and I'll say that every single day. I'm delighted at the deregulation in places like the FCC and elsewhere. I think we that's, are too. that's terrific. Yes, yes. Uh, and then out comes the president's budget with nary a mention of any serious entitlement reform or spending restraint and just deficits and debt as far as the eye can see. And I'm like, whoa, like, I didn't sign up for this. I, we, the debt math is just as bad, if not worse, as mm -hmm. it was at the end of Obama. We screamed about that for eight years and we were right. 
are we going to pretend that that all just magically disappears because there's a president with an R next to his name in the White House? And so, I don't know. It's I'm sort of libertarian-ish on on some issues. I'm feeling increasingly like a political nomad where I do not feel nearly as at home in the Republican Party as I once did, mm -hmm. but I also feel completely alienated from the Democratic Party. It's on, like they're trying. Yeah, yes. they're, they're like actively <laughs> vying of who can annoy me more. Right. Um, and they're both deeply annoying. I just happen to agree with the Republicans on more things more often. Right, well, and, and you guys both have mentioned center or nomads or not, you right. know, not being connected, if you will, with the establishment. And that's the thing. I think for so many people, they're just hungry for somebody to rationally discuss the truth and the facts without the hysteria. How are you guys, I mean, how, how do you bring that brand to the audiences that that you speak to? Well, I think it's it's a d sort of a daily struggle because like like Guy said, you do get flack from both sides mm -hmm. when you do it, but I do think there's an audience for it or else we wouldn't have jobs. Right. Um, and there is an audience, or there's a, the demand for sort of bringing people's blood pressures down right. a little bit. And I enjoy doing that because it, it allows you, to, by the way, because we feel a little bit politically homeless at the moment, we can identify uh, more readily with the independent voters, right, with swing right. voters, um, because we've oddly been put in this new position. And I think that's one of the challenges for the Republican Party moving forward is that a Trump administration has a way of taking voters who are, for instance, ex-urban, white, college-educated women and turning them into what might end up being swing voters mm -hmm. instead of Republican voters. Right. And that's sort of, it's a very important block for them. Um, and it's something that, you know, often like just the Democrats are chasing you away, it feels like Republicans are chasing them away. Well, and I think talk, that's a challenge for let, them. Let's talk a little bit about it, because the hysteria, right, that's the piece where it, it's not just reactionary, but it's a tool. And your book, let's go to your book, right, End of Discussion, um, it, that is just a tool that I think both sides kind of mastered in the 90s of let's just be completely to one side or the other to shut down the dialogue. Tell me, how did you guys come together to write the book, first of all, and then tell us a little bit about it? Well, we realized that having this job that we both have where we cover Washington every single day, we were losing our sanity slowly. <laughs> and so we would talk on the phone constantly. That's a big group up there. Though, yeah, no, know, I know. So. And so we're like, well, we're too cheap to pay for real therapy, so let's talk to each other on the phone every day. Okay. And this became a theme of this, this dueling war of outrage and insane overreaction and the impugning of motives to the point that we're not even, we're not even discussing rationally, for example, the tax reform bill, what will it do, who will it help, who might get hurt, what are the percentages, it is, this is going to kill people. This is Armageddon, and the world will end if the law passes. I may know who you're referring to. I, I, but, I couldn't, but, I couldn't uh, refer, yeah, refer yeah. to her by name. She's, she, I'll, okay. I'd give her a few crumbs later, but she, right. um, <laughs> it's not just her, it's the whole party on that. And the right. Republicans and the conservatives do this too, where we're not even discussing the issue anymore. Mm -hmm. It is as hyperbolic as it gets to try to disqualify the other side as bad or evil or hateful as a substitute for actual argument. And we thought this was really bad. So we decided let's write a book. And if we each do it together, it's half a book, half a book. which is easier right, right. than a whole book. And that seemed like a pretty good deal. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, well, fortunately for book sales, but unfortunately for America, End of Discussion, which came out in 2015, is more relevant now in 2018 than it even was when it came out, which is why we are still doing book events here in year three. Right. Because the appetite for it keeps growing because the problem is getting worse. And I would say uh, an additional thing that we noticed, um, as public figures, this is sort of the price we pay for being out there. We know to watch what we're saying. We know there's somebody who's paid to watch what we're saying mm -hmm. and take it probably out of context and right. blow it into a, a controversy. Uh, we noticed that tendency sort of trickling down to normal people who are just posting on Facebook. Right. Um, and I'm sure so many people have felt or this in their daily trolls, lives. Right? Yeah. Right? Trolling, <laughs> just, trolling. Just, like reg right. just regular people who have a political opinion and they worry about putting it on Facebook either for the social cost or economic cost because right. people, regular people, are losing jobs and losing income right. over mere political Squashing disagreements. Squashing free and that, speech or a venue of right, free speech. That does not sure. allow for yeah. any of the discussion we actually have to have. Yeah, all right. Well, well so, so the key takeaway of the book is? 
Do not try to win a debate by preventing the debate from happening at all or in a remotely honest way. Right, right. And I mean, some of the college campus speakers we've seen, I mean, that's the shout down of, of traditionally, at least the, the right thinking speakers. I can't think of a left leaning speaker that's been shouted off of a campus. It happens from time to time, but it yeah. much it's much more frequent on the right. And in fact, this was something I encountered this week at Brown University. Mm -hmm. At Brown? Uh, yeah, up, up in- uh, Very tolerant, liberal- Rhode Island, yeah. I, I was given a security briefing before my talk, including a designated escape route right. if things got ugly. I'm like, what I is mean, happening? I mean, it's nice to be shouted down by the best and brightest. Yeah, people, exactly. Oh, they're, they're Ivy League but, students, and so their shouting I mean, is very erudite. Yeah, that is such a foreign concept for, for you know, I would say, you know, people over 45, right? We just grew up with this fundamental, you know, kind of, kind of feeling that, of course you can speak your mind. This is America. You can stand on the box in the park and yell whatever you want, good, bad, or indifferent, and that was it. But now you say something that you believe in and you can literally have thugs chasing you down the street. Well, sorry, and I think there is a cultural shift and it's, there is a bit of a generational shift. It's, it's more pronounced on college campuses. Um, but one thing we have come to find and that we worry about is this loss of a cultural understanding of right. why free speech is important and if you're laying down rules about who can speak and why they can't speak, that that could easily be turned on you. And that seems to be lost on a lot of college students right. these days. And it's lost on college campuses, which are literally supposed to be places of free inquiry and have become almost the opposite. But I would say not most college students still. Right. I think there's still a majority who value what we value, but the people who don't are very loud, very practiced, very effective. Well, let's talk about one of the good sides of the internet and television, frankly. That's our industry here at Florida Internet and Television. And, and what I want to ask you guys is, is as uh, modern communicators, journalists, public figures, you know, how do you find the value of the internet and the tools that are out there to communicate with those people you're trying to communicate with or your fans or whomever? Like, like tell us a little bit about how that helps you do what you do. Well, I would say I'm, I'm a creature of this new modern era. My career is entirely based upon the, the situation I was given upon graduating from college, which was different than what, my dad was a newspaper man. Had I attempted to move up in newspapers, had anyone caught a caught whiff of my uh, my beliefs, I don't think that would have gone super well for me. But I had other venues that I could try. So I came up to DC, I did stuff on YouTube when it was very young in the political vein. Um, I was able to try a lot of things on the internet that people you know, had never really tried before and they thought, my bosses just thought, eh, throw some spaghetti at the wall and see how it goes. Right. Um, and being able to be myself, try these new venues really kind of made my career and gave me a chance at television um, because I had distinguished myself in sort of different new technologies. I'm not sure that that avenue would have existed for, for me and particularly for a conservative right. um, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. How about you, Guy? Well, multimedia, multi-platform is the present and it's definitely the future. So we have our perches on cable news, Fox and CNN. We also write, blog at sort of more traditional established websites. And then there's the whole social side. And I try to use each social media platform a little bit differently. So Twitter is probably my main one and it's a lot of politics, but I throw in all of my interests. So I tweet about sports and food and other stuff on there. And then Instagram, I generally try to keep a little bit less political right, and more about right. my personal life. And then Facebook gets weird, like, you know, where I have, <laughs> like, my own relatives attacking me for political things. I'm like, yep, love you too. Um, hey, that, that's, that's, it's it, how that's it goes. everybody, basically, it's how it on goes. Facebook, right? So, so I think part of it, though, is using those combinations of platforms to not just advance a message or to report or to get um, views out, but also to just remind people, like, hey, I'm a real person who really yes. exists in the real world. Right. I have interests and feelings that are not just all politics all the time. And the other right. thing is that one of the downsides of being able to tailor your exact news consumption is that you, you maybe you can create a situation where you don't hear much from the other side. Mm -hmm. But the, the other side of that coin is it's super easy to break that pattern. And so we, all, we always encourage people to do that because the bubble can get really damaging. Right. Um, but it's very easy to reach outside of that and just start following a couple of other people yeah. who appeal to you and are on the other side. Well, we'll, we'll definitely encourage folks to, to follow you as well. But uh, before we go, I know we've talked about a lot of important stuff, but we need to talk about something really important. Mm -hmm. right. When you guys aren't, aren't, aren't fighting for the free conservative mind, if you will, uh, what do you guys do to take your mind off the work that you do today? The Meaning, what do you stream? What do you binge watch? Watch. What do you pull down? Guy, we'll start with you. All right, so I'm a big sports fan. Okay. Uh, so I watch a lot of sports, especially college football and basketball. Okay. I'm a Yankees fan, a Devils fan, MLB and NHL, but Northwestern, 
football and basketball okay. or my that's my alma mater I'm really into that the um, basketball then, part's probably good but we're a football area down here so well football you know, hey we got 10 so, wins this year yeah that's good uh, that's, which that's is bad. yeah we, we finished it's better than a lot of Florida teams right either, and then, we so. finished ranked out. in the teens uh, which exactly. is really good for us because we're a small academic school so right. go cats uh, and then in terms of I, I definitely watch a lot of TV I yeah. have a DVR and Netflix um, the shows that I really enjoy I think the best show on TV and it's almost over is the Americans on FX yeah. I think it's awesome I watch Narcos on uh, Netflix right which now. is really it's really good pleasure for sure. um, I watch Top Chef in the reality realm yeah. I the show that I use to turn my brain <laughs> off my is the Great British Baking Show <laughs> uh, where just a bunch of adorable British people bake things in a oh, meadow and they're t are they terrible no they're very good oh, and, and, good and they're so good charming ones. with their okay. little accents right. and they're so supportive it's of each adorable. other yeah. so just like have a glass of wine and just watch some British people bake it's it's the best. It's very civilized. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mary Catherine, you're up. So what do you watch? I'm also a sports fan. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a large academic-ish school, University of Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> and so I watched UGA football. All right. I also grew up a Duke fan. Sorry, everyone. It Thank you. It was a you. huge year. It was a big year. I think the, the program dogs. the program is moving in the right direction, um, okay. to say the very least. Rose Bowl champions. To say the very least. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's exciting. Uh, other than that, uh, lately I've been watching um, Waco, which mm -hmm. is a sort of docudrama yeah. about uh, the Branch Davidians and um, a very strange show called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, yes. which is a strange <laughs> like parody rom-com plus a musical. There's but a lot of people that identify with uh, <laughs> that show, so. Uh, it, is, it is a fascinating show. I should also add, since this is all being recorded, um, I of course watch nothing but but the Fox News Channel, oh, same filled scene. with wonderful people, especially the bosses. <laughs> all right, all right. See, and it's also worth a watch. Yes, okay, wonderful, <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right, so, so um, for the viewers, how do they connect with you guys? Where do they follow you? Give us your handles, and uh, how do people get yeah. in touch? Uh, so on Twitter, I'm at MK Hammer, and on Instagram, at MK Hammer Time. Okay. It's always MK Hammer. Hammer something. Time. <laughs> I'm legit. Okay. Guy P. Benson. Uh, on both, on, on both Instagram both and Twitter, and I then mean, just Guy Benson on Facebook. Th there could be a little more hammer time ish to your handles, yeah, but hey, if that's working and that's where you go. Unfortunately, so like, we can't all be I'm Guy P. Now. Benson because right. Guy Benson uh, has all started. of them, and he's this liberal lawyer who hates ironic, me. <laughs> right, ironic. He uh, just gets trolled all the right. time. I know, see, like, his entire Twitter feed is like, that's not me. Yeah, <laughs> like, all right, right, your choice, sir, to well, keep the handle. Well, well, depending on the viewer, maybe they can follow both and really you know, step outside yeah. of their bubble. So thank you so much for coming on Fight TV. Thanks for coming to Tallahassee and being part of JMI's program. And uh, hopefully we'll get to have you guys on again sometime. Sure, totally. thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, that's all the time we have for today's show. Uh, hit us up on our Facebook and Twitter handles at FL Internet TV. That's all the time we have. Thanks for tuning in.